So my name is Dave Greenwald. I'm a gastroenterologist at Mount Sinai in New York. I would obviously like to congratulate um, Juha and Rob also for putting this together and as my good friend Dr. Coe said, for persevering and sticking through this, you know, and continuing to persevere. It's really, really important. We had a great meeting here a couple of years ago and the momentum, you know, carried forward. So it's great to see everybody again back in person. So I have the honor of um, co-chairing or co-moderating this last session. And the, the first speaker will be Dr. John Inadomi. So John is a well-known researcher um, and has done all sorts of work in cancer prevention. I mean, he has lots of insights for all of us. He was formerly at the University of Washington. He's now the chief of medicine at the University of Utah. And um, when uh, Dr. Koh mentioned that he knew the difference between the ACG and the AGA, that was a little dig at us, because we um, were both fortunate to be president of those various societies last year. So I and the ACG, John the AGA, and we collaborated wonderfully, as of course we did, and we're here today as well. So my pleasure to introduce my good friend, John Indomi. He's gonna to talk to us about clinical practice guidelines, and both of us think that guidelines are really, really important in moving this agenda forward. So John? Dave, hey, thanks so much. And, I, and again, um, I, th I think just the, the, um, I've learned a lot this, this, uh, this morning and this afternoon. And I think the big question right now is, you know, what kind of evidence would you need to really move this forward? How, what kind of evidence do we need to be able to put gastric cancer screening and surveillance forefront? Um, and that, I think that's um, what this, well, I hope to try to set the stage here. So um, in my role um, as uh, within, within one of the societies, we, we go through this guideline process. And I'll tell you about how the AGA does it. Uh, and in fact, I, I actually initiated the grade process for the AGA about 15 years ago. And so um, the reason for it is because um, in the old days, you know, just basically it was usually three guys, literally three guys. You sit in the back corner and say, hey, make a guideline, right? And, and it was basically eminence-based types of uh, guidelines that were put out there. Um, and so the Institute of Medicine had put out clinical practice guidelines we can trust. And it had these eight features. Right? I'm not going to read all of them. But probably the biggest things that were different about kind of the eminence space, going to the evidence space, was um, establishing transparency, but also managing conflict of interest. It's amazing the number of factors. You look at a various studies that look, studies that look at the authors of guidelines and look at the conflict of interest and the, how they differ from the recommendations in terms compared to guidelines that don't have that same kind of conflict of interest. Generally, conflict of interest is with industry, but also it's with grants and other things. Um, and that influences that third point, which is the, develop, uh, the, the group composition. And we'll talk a little about these other parts, too. Um, so in terms of uh, the AGA guidelines, when I first took over the, I guess at that point, it was the Clinical Practice and Quality Committee. We, had, we also had quality in there. And there, the evidence was not systematically evaluated, just basically kind of whatever people knew in their little Rolodex, although I don't think the young people know what a Rolodex is these days, right? But the bottom line is whatever you had in your, whatever you had in your files, your file cabinet of, of the evidence, that was what you kind of reviewed. So the risk of bias was very high. Bias meaning what you knew is kind of what you put in there. The transparency was lacking. And again, as I talked about, the, the conflict of interest, specifically with in, industry, uh, was, was not transparent. And you really couldn't tell whether the, uh, the guideline was of good quality or low quality, right? And so that's why we had to, I felt we had to change. And so um, among the different possibilities, including USPSTF, and I really appreciated uh, Doug's uh, 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 in, um, kind of insight about the USPSTF. Now that's actually really based on prevention, right, and screening. And so for us, the gastroenterology and hepatology, we had to devise some kind of framework with that, that would uh, account for not just screening, and prevention, but also treatment management. So we chose a grade methodology, and it was, um, it's only been around 20 years, basically, but it was informal, and then it was more formally established in 2002. And grade, grade stands for Grade and Recommendations Assessment Development and Evaluation. Uh, and, uh, and it basically has two major parts, which is uh, rating the quality of evidence, and then also the strength of the recommendations. And so right now, um, coming from that, it's the grade process has been uh, adopted by uh, more than 100 societies. And you can see here that both the AGA and the ACG are in here, but many, many other organizations. And um, it has really uh, several, several areas. Um, and I think the, the, one of the big parts is identifying this actual scope of the guideline. And they use these things called PICOs, 
And you hear about this when you know, PICO, PICO, PICO. Well, PICO stands for really, what is a question you're trying to answer with these guidelines? And there could be maybe three or four, right? But the PICO stands for the patient, which is that population of interest, the intervention, the comparator, um, and the outcomes, right? So those are the four. And the next is based on those questions, those PICOs, you go out and gather the evidence. The evidence should be in the form of systematic review, either an existing one, or if it doesn't exist, then you gotta commission one or do one on yourself, right? You can't just, again, open up your files and decide that you can pick and choose what's out there. So a rigorous systematic review is essential for the grade process. The next is a lot of people do this. A lot of the different, a lot of different uh, guideline kind of methods use this, assessing the quality of evidence. We'll talk a little bit about that. Really, what you're doing is trying to assess the study design and the risk of bias in this. But the difference in the grade process is that it looks at that particular PICO, that particular question across studies, not by individual study. And then the last part is assigning the strength of recommendation. And the important part is that the evidence and the, is only one part of this, right? It's not just evidence, but also um, is there an understanding of what the patient preferences are regarding a particular, uh, in this case, screening, right? Um, is there an assessment of harms and benefits? And Dr. Owens talked about looking at harms and benefits. And the last thing, we do actually look at resource use, unlike USPSTF, or uh, in terms of looking at resource use and cost and, and, and looking at uh, what, is, uh, the, the, what is required to provide this intervention at the expense of not doing other interventions. That's how we look at it. So um, what is, uh, GRADE actually looks at the methodological limitations, and then these are the risk of bias. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is not, concealed allocation, failure, blinding, incomplete reporting, losses to follow-up. Those are the kind of traditional parts of uh, limitations. Beyond that, we also look at inconsistency results. I really apologize for the, for the formatting. Indirectness as evidence, imprecision of results, and publication bias. So it's not only just the methodologic limitations, but how those methodologic limitations also affect the, um, the impact of those recommendations on kind of real world. So a little bit more details about this, right? So the certainty of evidence is what we're looking and that's beyond study design because the definition of certainty of evidence in this case is the extent to which our confidence in the estimate of the treatment effect is adequate to support a particular recommendation. Now, it's a lot of words, but basically it's like, how, how, how strongly do we believe what, we, what, what a recommendation will be? What kind of, what kind of data really do um, uh, provide the support for that recommendation? Is that are those data likely to change with additional information? That's what we're looking for, right? So when you look at the risk of bias, this is the traditional, traditional kinds of things. I'm not going to go a lot of details up, but it's, you know, concealed allocation and, and just, well, maybe I will do that. So blinding, of course, is when they, uh, whatever their observer is doesn't know what treatment, so there's no bias in terms of, oh, that person's getting that drug or not getting that drug, right? Concealed, uh, concealed allocation is a person who is enrolling the patient also doesn't know because there is a risk of bias and who you're going to invite to be in the study if you actually know what the next thing it coming up. That's why it's really much better to have these, um, these uh, things where there's an electronic version where you, as, uh, when you, when you can enroll a patient and it pops up to you. I, I know, remember all of us, uh, when you probably did studies as a, as a fellow or a resident, you know, you'd have these little opaque envelopes and everybody's like kind of looking to the light to say, what is that? Are they getting a treatment or is it going to be a control arm? And you would do this stuff because it really does affect, if you know what the next arm is, it may affect who you're going to enroll in the study. Intention to treat is also very important because there's a lot of barriers to in terms of uh, getting to the actual therapy, and we can talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that. Follow-up and, and early stoppage is also part of the methodologic issues. But beyond that, you have to look at inconsistency results, and that's why we, we, uh, in the grade process, we don't look at a single paper or a single study. We look at the same outcome across multiple studies, and this just illustrates the fact that sometimes a particular outcome may be positive in one study and it may be negative in another. And you have to take that into account when you look at the certainty of the evidence. The other thing is the indirectness. You oftentimes don't get the right comparator. And this is really important. When you look at a PICO, you know, it's a patient, the, uh, the, the intervention, and the comparator, right? It's, it's really hard to get the same comparator or even the right patient population. So if you look at different studies, you will have a lot of trouble making sure that the right comparator, you, and, and in, I was going to say in terms of like cancer studies, you know, it, is it the right stage uh, of cancer? Um, oftentimes, their, their different studies will, will have a varying stage in different populations. Um, oftentimes, the way that intervention is applied is different, right, across different studies. So the indirectness really points to the fact that 
are your studies that you're looking at, um, have, uh, are they similar in the patients, the intervention, the comparative, the outcomes, right? Those are the really important things. Um, and this is the same little, little diagram, but the imprecision of results, that's the confidence intervals. And this is just to illustrate that, yeah, across studies, you may not have, the, you may be consistent in terms of, yeah, everything shows benefit, but what is the confidence with which uh, we are able to say that particular outcome? And, and whether it is likely or unlikely that those, again, those results would change with additional information. And lastly, publication bias. We all know that positive results are more likely to get published. Um, and um, having just rotated off the, uh, our, our, uh, our uh, gastroenterology journal, and I see Dr. Peek out there, uh, we do look at this a lot. And the problem is, is that it's really hard to get a negative study published, right? Because you just don't have that same kind of impact. I'm not going to say impact factor. The same kind of impact with a negative study, right? So there is publication bias. So this is important to look at. It's not just the methodologic issues that most kind of processes look at, but all these other issues beyond study design that impact the evidence, right? So in general, in general, um, our randomized controlled trials are kind of the highest, so they start with the highest evidence, right? And then observational studies, like case control studies, would be rather low. And then we have a sign of a quality of evidence from high to very low. Now, you can have a, uh, a randomized controlled trial, but the, uh, the, that um, quality of evidence can be rated lower across different studies if there's specific uh, 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 study methodological issues within the studies themselves, or if there's inconsistency in the results across studies, or again, these ideas about indirectness and precision or publication bias. So, an RCT doesn't mean you're going to have high level of evidence. You could get it de uh, degraded if, in fact, there are problems with these other, uh, other criteria. Now, remember also with observational studies, normally, it's like, yeah, in the old days, you're going to blow it off. Oh, yeah, it's a case control study or it's just a cohort study with historical controls. Now, you can, if, if, um, you can raise the quality of evidence, let's say, if the, if the effect size is really large, right? If you have an intervention and you have a relative risk of 0.5 and you get a 50% reduction in mortality, that actually means something, right? Or a very large effect, let's say 0.2, which is an 80% reduction in whatever the outcome is, right? Also, if there's a dose response, you know, if you have some drug X and the higher do dose and another higher dose and each of these doses, you get a higher and higher effective benefit, that really does show mechanism, right? So part of the problem with some of these observational studies is that you don't have mechanism. You don't have a mechanistic understanding. But if you see a dose response, that supports a mechanism. The other thing we also look at is if you look at all the plausible confounders, like everything that could screw up a study and make something look good, right? If all the plausible confounding makes it actually kind of balance to the null or to, to no effect, um, and, and, and all this, and so then you know it's like, well, gosh, you know, this is as good a study as you can get, and every Every kind of confounding we can have actually makes it look like it doesn't work, and yet it works. It's like, well, that actually makes it stronger. So the quality of evidence of that particular PICO may actually be increased. So again, I, like I said, it was the old system is look at individual studies, you rate them. This particular process, you look at different outcomes across multiple studies. Now again, um, what I said, not only is the, the looking at the quality of the evidence based on those, those kinds of criteria, we also look at three other criteria, right? And that is the balance between benefits and harms. Now, the problem oftentimes is that in these studies, you don't actually have this balance, right? It's kind of subjective, but you do have a list of here's the harms, here's the, 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 the benefits, right? And the, um, the harms may not simply be uh, like, a, like serious medical events. Um, we do believe that harms include costs because of the fact that whenever you have a, a resource, and, and, and money spent in one thing, it means that you have, you've lost the ability to invest in something else. And screening is especially important because generally when you put money into screening, you don't get that benefit for you know, decades or even eons. Eons? What is an eon? Wait, a long time later, right? So there's this problem with discounting, right? So you have an immediate investment, and by the time you get your benefit, your, your money is already discounted, right? So that's always a problem with any kind of screening uh, process. So, you have to worry about those kinds of things, too. We also have to look at the patient's values and preferences, as that's why it's so nice to see patient advocates. And Aki, thanks so much for your comments, because the patient's values and preferences. And oftentimes, we get it wrong, you know, as physicians, a as investigators. You know, we, we really don't understand what that value, what their preferences are. And that's why 
the importance of, of involving community, involving patients and their, and their families and caregivers is so essential. And again, we talked about resource use. And based on, again, the quality of evidence and these three other factors, then you can come up with a recommendation and strong versus conditional. The language we use for the AG is, if the AG recommends, that's a strong recommendation. If the AG suggests, that's a conditional recommendation. What does that really mean? Um, well, I'll get, I guess I'll, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll talk about that in one second. Um, so the, the other thing we try to do to manage the conflict of interest is to have two separate kind of bodies. And, uh, and a lot of people uh, really kind of rail against this because this is kind of, it's really uh, against the old school, right? So the reason to do this is because a technical review uh, requires experts to know like the real hot topics, the controversies, the literature, the emerging evidence, studies that aren't even published, right? So we do need experts to, to, to really help us to understand the, the literature. However, these experts are the same people who probably have the greatest conflict of interest because they actually have, they're the ones who other people, the key opinion leaders, right? They have the um, industry, uh, 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 they're on advisory boards, scientific advisory boards, and they're, they're also on, get funding from their own grants. So it's not just industry, but even like NIH funding. You know, if you put together something and you have a guideline and it basically says, you better do, John, you better do studies and looking at colon cancer screening adherence, you know, and I put that out there. It's like, guess what? They can appoint to that in my grant application and say, look, the guideline says we need to have, you know, studies on adherence to colon cancer screening. So you gotta realize that conflict occurs in many different ways, not just industry. Now, we separate the technical view with the guideline, um, and this is very similar to the NIH consensus development process, and the reason is because the guidelines require stakeholders that represent all the players in the topic, not just the gastroenterologists in this case, or the primary care physicians, but pathologists, and radiologists, and surgeons, and pharmacy, and our patients, and the community, right? And here it says we must be free from conflict of interest. I don't think anybody's truly free. No, that's not right. Nobody's really tre free, well, that's probably true. No, nobody's really tru truly free. Everybody has an interest, or somebody probably has some bias. Into, but we, as to, as best we can, best we can, we try to minimize any kind of conflict of interest that would otherwise bias the, the, the guidelines, right? So there's a separation. There's a technical review uh, group of people who actually come up with the evidence, and they present it to the guideline panel, and, and the guideline panel is actually the ones who actually develop the actual guidelines. We can talk about that, right? So the implications of a strong recommendation, remember I said it was strong or, or, or conditional, but the strong recommendation for different populations, so the population wouldn't be, doesn't mean to have a strong recommendation. It means that most people in this situation would want this thing, and only very few people wouldn't, right? For the healthcare worker, it really means that when you go through this process, uh, most, most likely that person should, re re uh, your patient in front of you should receive that recommended course of action. And for policymakers, like, Basically, you know, when you talk about quality measures, when you talk about reimbursement, it really means that recommendation should be adapted as policy, meaning it should be reimbursed or it should be a quality measure, right? Now, conditional recommendations um, really are, again, still recommending that something be done or not done, but in terms of the population, the majority of people in the situation would want it, but many, not just few, but many would not, with, with regards to healthcare workers or providers or clinicians, be prepared to help people think about this, right? This is where clinical decision tools are really helpful, where it's a little ambiguous, where they really have to kind of figure out what are the patient preferences, what are the harms and the benefits? And those are that shared decision-making process that's really important. And for policymakers, there's probably still some debate and some involvement of those stakeholders, right? So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about, um, I was gonna talk about Barrett's, but I thought, you know, I, uh, Doug Morgan and I, we, we've talked a lot about this, and so, I talk a little bit about how the AGA guideline in, t in terms of gastric intestinal, intestinal metaplasia came about. Um, there are a lot of controversies about that, and Doug can like, make comments uh, subsequent to that on, on terms of uh, uh, gastric cancer screening and intestinal metaplasia from other um, societies. Um, this is a lot of stuff right here, but I'm just going to read out the fact that there were four four questions. So it's very limited. It's not like, gosh, it's not the that's not the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? It's these four things, and if you can read them here, it's among patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia, does testing for H. pylori in treating versus no testing affect patient important outcomes, right? So that's a major one. The next two are, are basically the same. One is among patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia who are at low risk, that's number two, or at high risk, that's number three, does subsequent upper endoscopy surveillance versus no follow-up uh, affect important outcomes? And then the last one is, among patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia without dysplasia, 
is that risk assessment endoscopy within a year, I mean, it's not really a surveillance, but regular risk assessment to determine the extent of GIM or those other kind of pathologic uh, parameters affect patient important outcomes. And those patient important outcomes were early cancer detection, cancer, morbidity, mortality, endoscopy complications, costs, and psychological harms, right? And so I'm not going to go through the whole thing on the right thing, but basically those are all the systematic reviews that have to be done just to answer these four PICOs. Right? We can talk about those later. But just to, so the, the, um, this is the bottom line, and this is the part where we can have more discussion about it. But basically in terms of that first question, in patients, with, patients who have gastric intestinal metaplasia, it's recommending, that recommends, so it's a strong uh, recommendation, testing for H. pylori followed by eradication over no testing and eradication. Again, this is not screening. This is among patients who have gastric intestinal metaplasia. And then in, in patients with gastric intestinal metaplasia, the AGA suggests, so again, it's a conditional, against routine use of endoscopic surveillance. And this is the part where we got all kinds of, and, and true, this is the part we should probably talk about this, right? And why do they say this? Because when we look at the total population of the US, right, it doesn't make sense, really, probably, and I think people would agree, it doesn't make the entire sense to, the, to, to try to do surveillance in the entire population, but those people with intestinal metaplasia are higher risk of gastric cancer include those, and we can read them here, incomplete intestinal metaplasia, extensive metaplasia, family history of gastric cancer, and those people who are at overall risk for, GI, for gastric cancer beyond GIM, which includes certain, almost all racial and ethnic minorities or Im immigrants from high endemic, in, high incidence or high endemic regions. That was very, that was conditional, and the evidence admitting is very low. I'm going to kind of stop right here because the issue is that um, it's really important to understand that the absence of evidence doesn't mean it's not right or wrong, right? There's an absence of evidence. And I want to stress that, right? It's, I, I always view this as not, oh yeah, gosh, this is, the AJ got it wrong. It's just basically, here we are, we're understanding that this is the opportunity. These are the data that are needed to actually progress forward. And without these data, it's, it's hard to say what to do, right? So in this particular case, is we basically say, gosh, we shouldn't do surveillance in everybody, but in certain areas, that conversation with the patient may make sense to do surveillance, right? But the quality of evidence sucks, right? We just know this, and so this is an opportunity. This is an area where we should, really should ad ad advance our field by getting more evidence, right? The other part, the part three, was that looking to do that, um, oh gosh, it was that, uh, that, that risk assessment endoscopy also uh, there was not any evidence. There really was no evidence that would, that would support or not support this particular activity, right? So it was a conditional, but again, very low quality of evidence. The other part that really was supposed to be part of, of PICOs 2 and 3 was really, really a surveillance interval. And, the, and again, there were insufficient data to guide that optimal surveillance interval. So you can read this stuff here. But the problem is, again, is that what, do we, what is the level of evidence? You know, in general, what we're talking about is a randomized controlled trial. Now, again, it takes 88,000 people, as Dr. Ng talked about. I mean, it's a lot of people, a lot of stuff going on, right? But, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that, um, that would bring to, uh, would really advance the field forward, right? To really do properly, uh, uh, properly powered randomized controlled trials to understand either screening or, in this case, surveillance. So, gosh, here are the limitations, and, and, and this is the, I'm going to maybe just, uh, this is my last couple of slides. So, um, clearly, you know, are we asking the right PICOs? Because um, I know Juha and I have, have um, I was going to say, discussions, arguments. <laughs> this is usually between swings, because <laughs> Juha is my golf coach. And I always know that, uh, that, that I'm, 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 I'm kind of ticking him off when he starts saying, okay, well, why don't you have these three or four swing thoughts in your head before your next shot? So I know I pissed him off at some point. But let's just talk about this. You are probably aren't ra asking all the right PICOs, or rather, the problem is that the PICO we want, the question we want to ask, there are not the right data to answer that question. And I think that's the major, that's where the conflict is, right? You know, here we want to say, look, we want to do uh, gastric cancer screening, right? We know there, there aren't any randomized controlled trials, so perhaps the PICO can't be, can we do gastric cancer screening, but rather we have to develop something uh, that basically um, allows us to do something with the evidence that we do have right now, right? And then the big question is, you know, does that ev evidence allow us to do something actionable, clinically relevant, right? So in terms of this PICOs, um, one of the big things is can you extract data from other countries to the U.S.? This is, this is, this is, uh, this is something we should talk about, right? Certainly when you talk about immigrants, 
from these other countries. I certainly believe you can, right? But in terms of looking at the entire U.S. population, you know, how do you actually say this is a policy decision, this is something that the, that the payer should pay for, when the population doesn't represent the U.S. population? So we should think about that. Interventions, we talked about, is, is the same intervention across all studies? Usually not. Usually there's something different. If nothing other than, let's say, the endoscopist, the quality of the endoscopist may vary quite a bit across these different studies. And how do we actually count for that? The comparator, you know, so we have the intervention with the comparator. So this comes up now in, we're, we're redoing the Barrett's cancer, Barrett's screening thing. This is the last thing I'll tell you about Barrett's. And we're not, we're stuck there. It's like for an hour we talked about, well, should this be surveillance versus, no, should we do endoscopic ablation versus not doing endoscopic ablation? Or we should say we said endoscopic ablation versus surveillance. And then for the first thing, I said, what are you talking about? You know, it's just such a nerdy, pointed headed question. But the issue is the difference is that if you look at um, doing nothing, then you actually can't, can't actually, well, if you, yeah, if you do it versus surveillance, then you really can't have answer the question, should you do surveillance or not? And so now we're trying to figure, oh gosh, you know, we gotta do surveillance versus no surveillance, or we're doing uh, eradications for surveillance, eradications versus nothing. So this is, these are the kind of crazy discussions you get at that take hours to resolve, but then, Based on that decision, you can or may not be able to make the right recommendation. I know it's really getting in the weeds, but here we go. Um, and the outcomes, you know, this is the big, big problem, right? The data that we have are, are there's some great data, right? But are they data that really have the outcome we want? Meaning uh, death from gastric cancer, incidence of gastric cancer, or is it more of the surrogates, which is, you know, a, re a reduction in um, or, or, or um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the rate of in, uh, metaplasia and the progression of metaplasia, what really people are talking about is morbidity and mortality from gastric cancer. And those are the problems with most of the data we have right now, right? And so the limitations of guidance really is evidence. You know, is it feasible or even ethical to obtain the data needed to? Can we do this, uh, this study? Or is it ethical to withhold endoscopy in some of these people? How are you going to get the information if it's not deemed to be ethical, right? And so those are the things that I, um, I guess it does keep me up at night. It really does. You know, and then the other parts, besides the evidence, are data available to assess the harms and benefits of patient preferences and resource use? Usually not. Those are the issues, and that's why it's so difficult, right? So, um, and this is my last thing. So this great process is an internationally recognized rigorous framework enabling not just the AGA, but, you know, many organizations to produce impactful guidelines. It fulfills the requirements of development of quality measures that could be used linked to financial reimbursement, which then drives behavior, right? You're asking, how do you get people to do something? You pay them to do it, right? Or, or how do you get them not to do something? You don't pay them for it. They, they, they don't have to, it doesn't take much, right? It, it really works, right? But the problem is here, and I understand this, and this is the thing that we really have to work on, and maybe the discussion is, the limitations of these processes we have for guideline development, um, really, you cannot answer many of the questions we want to have answered. Right, and I understand that. But the issue is if we don't do this, then it's very difficult for policymakers to make these, and it's very difficult to then require, yes, require payers to actually pay for these things. So hopefully that's enough of a stimulation of a discussion, and hopefully we can get some of these answers later on in today's session. So thanks.